Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. A very good morning, and you're welcome to today's Signpost webinar. I hope you're keeping safe and well. Uh, the series is brought to you by Chagas Connected in association with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Road Network and Food Drink uh, uh, Ireland Skillnet. And so this morning, uh, today on the Signpost webinar, uh, we're going to be focusing on sheep systems. And to date, we've largely focused our discussions on cattle and dairy production systems. So today we'll be looking at measuring methane in Irish sheep systems and what is the carbon hoofprint of the sector in Ireland and uh, delighted to be joined by Drs. Noreen uh, McHugh, uh, Dr. Fiona McGovern, and Dr. Jonathan Heron, uh, who are going to be speaking to us today about uh, the, the sheep sector in Ireland. And Andy Boland, you're going to help us with questions this morning. Good morning, Andy. Good morning, Mark. So if I could talk, uh, speak, start with you, Fiona, and maybe you could just tell us a bit, little bit about the work that you're doing. You're based in Athenry. Yeah, that's right, Mark. So I'm a research officer based at the Sheep Research Centre in Athenry in County Galway. Um, my main role is working on genetic and non-genetic factors affecting production and looking at production efficiencies <clears> across <throat> the sheep sector. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Fiona. And Noreen, you're coming to us from Moor Park. Is that right? Yeah, the sunny side this morning. Yeah. Yeah, so my role here in Moor Park, I'm a sheep and beef geneticist. Um, so um, most of my work is, is supporting the breeding program, the national breeding program for sheep and beef and trying to improve the profitability and sustainability of both industries. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Noreen. And Jonathan, you're also coming from Moor Park. Uh, good morning to you. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Um, yeah, my name is Jonathan Hearn. I'm a researcher based in Moor Park, as you said, and the area I'd be focusing on is uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, modelling uh, from ruminant systems in Ireland and identifying uh, management practices uh, that can reduce emissions and identifying different mitigation strategies as well. So, yeah. So, Jonathan, I think you're going to kick us off this morning with the, your your part of the presentation. Um, so, if you could share your screen with us, and just while you're doing that, to remind everybody that uh, you can send us, and we really do want to hear your questions using the Q and A. A tab at the bottom of the screen. Um, the session is being recorded and will be available on the Chagas YouTube channel, along with uh, the presentations then will also be available on the Chagas uh, main website. And if uh, you don't get a chance to, to watch our uh, uh, webinars live, you can also listen to them uh, on the podcast. So I'll hand over to you, Jonathan and uh, Noreen and Fiona, and uh, we'll talk to you shortly. Yeah, so um, as I said, my name is Jonathan Hearn, I'm based in Moor Park, and today myself, Noreen and Fiona will be talking to you about uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the Irish sheep sector, uh, specifically methane and how we can uh, and uh, how we can reduce uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. So just uh, to begin with, uh, just to provide a bit of uh, context, uh, what exactly is the Irish sheep sector? So the Irish sheep sector is largely focused on spring lamb production, it's the dominant system in, in our country. And as, and as of uh, 2020, there was 2.7 million breeding ewes in, in Ireland. And you can see here on the right hand side, the top, hand, the top graph, uh, the population of sheep in Ireland um, peaked at, in 1993 uh, at approximately 9 million sheep. So that's including ewes, lambs, replacements, as well as rams. And there was a gradual decline from that point down to 2010. Uh, where it reached its low point and has increased marginally um, up until uh, today. However, it is very, uh, very, very small. Uh, of the, the breeding yews within Ireland, um, it's dominated by lowland breeds. So that's your Suffolk's, it's your Charlie's, it's your Texels. Um, so that makes up to 80%. And then we have 20% coming from hill breeds. So that's your Blackface and uh, Mountain yews and your Shevets. These sheep, they are... I suppose they're spread across uh, 35 and a half thousand farms uh, in Ireland. So that have some form of sheep enterprise where the average farm uh, has 83 breeding ewes. This is all coming from uh, the CSO's uh, latest report. Um, within that 35 and a half thousand farms, 17,400 are specialized sheep farms. So it's either the dominant system or else it's the sole system. Uh, Ireland itself. Uh, so um, we are, uh, we, we're 335% uh, self-sufficient in sheep meat. So as a result, we are we export a large quantity of sheep meat. Uh, we're, we're one of the largest in Europe. 
And in um, the most recent Board B report, um, our dio sheep uh, meat exports came to a value of 420 million. And this is an increase of 12% based in 2020, so quite a substantial increase um, uh, over a one year period. Our largest market is actually Europe itself, with France being the largest market within Europe of where we're exporting uh, approximately 30.5% of that value uh, to France. So while this is all very positive and um, you know, the outlook, the economic outlook for the sheep sector is it's, it's relatively uh, pos positive, it's also very important to note that sheep are ruminants and as a result to do um, emit greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and livestock has been identified uh, at international level and national level as being a notable source of greenhouse gas emissions, where in Ireland, 37% uh, of our national emissions come from the agricultural sector. And this is a comparison to an EU average of 12, and it just kind of reflects that we're an agriculture based country. We've, we've less uh, uh, industry um, related emissions in comparison to our other European counterparts on the continent. And it's also reflective that our agriculture sector is dominated by um, ruminant systems and, and, and even more so dominated by uh, cattle systems. We can see here on the top right hand, uh, right, right hand side, this is our uh, trends in national agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. Where of today, uh, of 2020, we have emitted, uh, we emitted 21, um, 21 megatons of CO2 equivalent um, in, in that year, and it's dominated, as you can see in the blue in the blue uh, bar, uh, and turk fermentation, which is your methane. When we look at the sheep, then uh, the sheep emissions follow the same trend as the population uh, graph I showed uh, previously. So it reached a peak in uh, the mid 1990s, uh, 1.6 megatons uh, in 1995. Uh, decreased uh, 2010 and, and since then it's relatively flatlined if not a slight increase in emissions since then where the sheep just uh, sh uh, the sheep uh, the animal emissions uh, coming from the sheep sector contributes approximately one megatons uh, to our national agriculture emissions so relatively small in comparison uh, to um, the cattle sector however regardless uh, the agricult agriculture does contribute as i said 37% so therefore it has to be at the forefront in terms of mitigating greenhouse gas emissions and ensuring that we reach our you know we meet our international obligations to reduce our emissions and reach our our targets that have been set for us and um, to see this happen um, to, to to allow this happen we need to know exactly what is the baseline um, and what we do to do that we need to know what are the greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, um, being emitted at a farm level um, and what, what management practices can be implemented to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The method which we use to calculate this is life cycle assessment. So not only do we just look at the emissions that occur on farm, we also need to account for the emissions that are generated uh, through um, the production of farm inputs. So the likes of your fertilizer, your concentrate, your electricity. And essentially what this is, we are calculating the total greenhouse gas emissions up to the point in which the product leaves the farm gate. So whether it's the lamb, uh, a cullio, a ram or wool. When we do that, we calculate the total emissions and then we can express that uh, depending on um, um, your, your, the metric of choice. So you could do it per kilo of live weight sold, per kilo of carcass weight or per hectare. So when we apply this, um, we can calculate the average carbon footprint uh, of um, of a, of a sheep system within Ireland. So um, exercise myself, uh, Noreen and Fiona uh, done recently is we pulled from um, the likes of the National Farm Survey and CSO, what is an average lowland sheep system in Ireland? And this is the data that we uh, would have, that we, uh, which we um, obtained. So on average, the stock rate is around 7.7 euros uh, per hectare. The average sheep uses uh, seven, 73 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. Average lamb in month is March. However, it's important to note that does it's spread across a number of months within um, the, uh, among, in spring. On average, um, we uh, the lambing rate um, is 1.5 lambs per year. Um, but when it comes to weaning, uh, an average year weans 1.37 lambs per year. And this is at a weight of 30.7 uh, kilos. The target uh, drafting weight, so the slaughter weight, is 45 kilos, and that is to achieve the target industry uh, carcass of uh, 20 kilos. So this is what is deemed as an average lowland uh, system. When we simulate this and we put this into our life cycle assessment model, what we get is an average carbon footprint of 10.7 kilos of CO2 equivalent per kilo of live weight, 
And when we express it on a hectare basis, it's 5.7, um, 5.8 uh, tonnes of CO2 equivalent per hectare. When we look at the breakdown of where the emissions are coming from, from an average sheep system, we can say the dominant source is methane uh, in, the blue, in, the, in the blue bear. And this is just through the fermentation of feed um, uh, by uh, the sheep themselves. The second uh, main source would be uh, nitrous oxide. And this is coming from the likes of the application of the synthetic fertilizer, which is dominantly used for the likes of silage production. And then we have um, emissions coming from manure. So manure when a cattle are, when the sheep are out grazing and when um, the sheep are indoors um, um, on um, a silage based diet and how that manure is handled. And then finally, we have carbon dioxide um, uh, emissions, which contributes approximately 16%. And this is sourced from the likes of concentrated feed production, as well as the, the use of fossil fuels uh, on farm as well as off farm. So that's where we are, as, uh, that's our baseline. So from that point, we know where we're starting. How can we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions on an average farm to ensure that we can contribute to um, greenhouse gas mitigation and allow us to achieve the targets that have been set? So the targets have released um, or have published uh, the marginal abatement and cost curve. And within that, there is a number of areas that can be applied within um, the sheep sector. So firstly, improvement of, of grassland management. So to begin with, from the soil up, if you correct your pH to the target of 6.3, uh, of 6.3, uh, address any P or K issues in, uh, in achieving that uh, P and K index of uh, three, that allow you to, um, it'll, it'll help you to establish white clover in your sward and as well as the incorporation of clover in your sward. That allow you to reduce your, uh, your reliance on synthetic fertilizer, which is both economically beneficial, but also uh, beneficial in terms of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Adopting a rotational grazing uh, system uh, will ensure that there's high quality grass in front of um, the lambs at all times, which, um, which will essentially help you to reduce your requirement for the purchase and the concentrate feed, which as similar to fertilizer is, uh, is a, a financial burden. And that will also contribute to uh, allowing that animal to express itself to uh, reach its optimum live weight gain, which will reduce its, uh, the time period from birth until slaughter, which will reduce the total lifetime uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Other areas that could be improved uh, uh, that could be adopted is like your fertilizer type. So switching from can-based fertilizer protected urea, and this has been already highlighted within this webinar on num a number of um, a number of episodes. And then finally, uh, genetic selection. And Noreen is going to go into this in detail, but how this improves, uh, em reduces emissions is your uh, increasing the number of lambs uh, survived and uh, to weaning uh, per year, and you're also through selecting uh, appropriate sires, you can reduce, you can increase uh, the daily live weight gain uh, for those lambs. So that's just where we are at the moment. So as I said, average carbon footprint is approximately 10.7. Uh, we, know, we know what practices are, are available to us that we can reduce those emissions. What needs to be, up, what needs to be in, uh, researched further is, first of all, our national inventory is uh, based on a tier one methodology. Um, so it's may, it may not be representative of sheep, sheep in Ireland, but also it may do. Um, it's not flexible enough to allow us to basically see the reward of ad adopting such mitigation strategies. So that's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, secondly is our life cycle assessment. It is a tier two methodology, so it's more, um, it's more sensitive uh, than uh, what's in the inventory. However, it is largely based on international studies, not necessarily coming from um, from um, sheep within Ireland or even the production systems in Ireland. So to develop um, country specific emission factors for sheep sector um, is, um, is, uh, is an overarching objective um, at the moment for Chagas. And this will flow into um, what, what Fiona will be talking about, which is uh, methane. So this, as we said, methane is the dominant source of greenhouse gases, so you're over 60%. And uh, Fiona will talk about the research that is being conducted in um, methane emissions uh, for, um, in Ireland. So thank you very much. Um, I'll let you share, Fiona. As Jonathan said, um, while sheep are overall a small contributor to our national greenhouse gas emissions, they are still a ruminant animal and 64% of our total greenhouse gas emissions is coming from methane. So it is something that we need to look at across the sheep sector. And today there has been very little work done on it, um, but it is now one of our focus areas here in the sheep research program. So 
I will go through with you some steps that we're taking to measure methane within our sheep systems um, and to put some data behind our baseline values um, and to investigate how we can mitigate methane from our sheep systems even further. So I suppose when you think about methane, obviously we can't see it. It's a gas that's produced from all ruminant animals. Similarly to how we as humans breathe out carbon dioxide, um, our sheep or cattle will actually um, burp or breathe out methane. So about 85 to 90% of the methane that's produced is actually produced out through the mouth and nose of the animal. Um, and essentially it is a waste product of digestion. So when the animal is eating a fiber source, so whether that be grass or silage or another forage, they're digesting it and there's um, excess hydrogen released into the rumen. So there's, micro there's microbes living in the rumen um, and they convert this hydrogen into methane gas so that it can be excreted from the animal. So if you think about it from a nutritional perspective, the methane that the animal is producing is not only a waste product, so it's co costing the animal energy to be able to produce it um, and to excrete it, but it's also meaning that the animal is not utilizing the food that they're eating to enough an extent as they're producing more waste product. So I think we need to look at it this way, as well as seeing it as a negative for the environment and something that we need to mitigate. It's also costing us um, money and energy to our animals if we're feeding them in a manner that means that they're producing more methane. Um, so there are multiple levels that we can look at it at. Um, so I will go through some methods with you now as to how we measure it across our sheep system. So there are respiration chambers. Um, some of you may or may not be familiar with these. So they are literally glass boxes um, that the sheep go into and they remain inside the chamber for a period of time. Um, and their methane and carbon dioxide output is measured throughout this period. So the next picture is showing portable accumulation chambers, and I'll talk about these in more detail in a few moments. And the final picture is looking at SF6 or the sulfur hexafluorodioxide technique, which measures animals um, at pasture using the space-like apparatus that they're wearing here in the picture. Um, the final method that can be used to measure ruminant animal methane production um, and is routinely used in Ireland for measuring methane from dairy and beef animals are green feeds. Um, but to date, we don't have green feed monitors for measuring within our sheep system. So I'll just talk in a little bit more detail about each of the apparatuses. Um, so the respiration chamber, so it's a glass box and one animal fits in each chamber and they stay in there for a 48 hour period. So as you can see in the picture, we can measure their feed intake and their water intake during this time. Um, they are deemed the gold standard for both sheep and cattle methane measurements. Um, so across the world or internationally, they're deemed as the gold standard method. They allow for feed and water intake and the values that we get from animals in respiration chambers are accepted into our national inventory calculations. So as Jonathan spoke about, if we want tier two calculations, um, the respiration chamber values are accepted into that. The negatives, I suppose, from the respiration chambers then, so there is low animal throughput. Um, the chambers are very expensive both to build, but also to operate. And you can only fit in one animal at a time. Um, it is quite a labor intensive method because when the animals are in the chamber, they need to be supervised and they obviously need to be individually fed um, each day or sometimes multiple times during the day. The animal is also not in their natural environment when they're in the chamber. As you can imagine, a sheep is used to being outdoors grazing, but when they're in the chamber, they're in a housed situation. When we look at the SF6 technique then, so the individual set of equipment is required per animal and a measurement run will take approximately six days. Um, there are really good correlations or relationships between sheep measured using SF6 and also using respiration chambers. So we're seeing a correlation or a relationship of about 0.7 between the two techniques. You want that number to be as close to one as possible. So it is quite good. Um, they allow animals to be measured at pasture. So the equipment is fitted onto the animal and then they're allowed to go out and graze and they wear the equipment for a full 24 hour period. 
and each 24 hours, the canisters on the top of the animal's back are uh, monitored and the gas is changed within those. And these values are also accepted to the national inventory. Um, obviously some negatives associated with this, as you might imagine. So again, there's some low animal throughput because you need a set of equipment for each individual animal. It can be quite expensive technique, mainly due to the equipment required and it is labor intensive. Um, as you can imagine, the sheep can have a lot of fun trying to scratch and take the equipment off. They get quite used to it quite quickly, but um, yeah, making sure that it's in a stable position on the animal can be challenging. And then the final method that I'll talk about are the portable accumulation chambers or pack chambers as we refer to them. So they're a series of 12 aluminium boxes that are mounted onto a trailer. Um, Chagas have pack chambers now since 2019 and we purchased them from New Zealand. So we're the first country in the Northern Hemisphere to have pack trailers for sheep. Um, so you can fit 12 animals per run. So it's one animal per box and you can see one box here in the picture, but our trailer has 12 individual boxes. So we have capacity to measure up to 72 animals per day using pack chambers. A measurement run takes 50 minutes. So the sheep enter the chamber for 50 minutes. And during this time, their methane, oxygen and carbon dioxide is recorded. Um, so some positives to using the portable accumulation chambers the values correlate quite well, so moderately to strongly well with the respiration chambers. And we've carried out some work in Chagas where we've done a validation experiment comparing the pack chambers directly to the respiration chambers, where we've seen a correlation of 0.55 between the two techniques. And then we've also done some work comparing the pack chambers to the SF6 equipment. Um, so it allows animals to be measured from a pasture-based diet. Um, so they can come in from the field, go through the chambers and go back out to grazing. There is obviously higher animal throughput than the last two measurements I talked about, and it is more labor efficient. So you're getting more animals done for the same, I guess, labor cost. Um, some negatives associated with the chambers. So the values obtained from the portable accumulation chambers can only be used as a ranking tool. So at the moment, they're not accepted into the national inventory, both in Ireland or in New Zealand. Um, it is something that we are working on, but for now, they can only be used as a ranking tool. So we can rank one animal versus another, or um, you know, if we wanted to look at one diet type versus another, one breed type versus another, for example. Um, the equipment is moisture sensitive, which in Ireland isn't ideal, as you can imagine, but um, we found that there's been no issues once we're under a roof or within a shed for measurements. So I'll just explain to you in a little bit more detail how we're collecting the data using the pack chambers. So the animals are removed from feed for a minimum of one hour before they enter the chambers. Their live weight is recorded on the day of measurement. They enter the pack for a 50 minute period. And then during this time, so at zero minutes, so straight away when they enter, 25 minutes after entry and 50 minutes after entry, their methane and carbon dioxide production and the oxygen consumed by the animal while they're in the chamber is recorded. So by taking these measurements, it allows us to extrapolate the values and to give us a grams per day value of methane output from the animal. So what have we done so far? Um, so to date, we've collected over 7,000 methane records from animals. So we have over 1,800 records from lambs, over 800 records from hoggets. So they're dry animals between 12 and 24 months of age. And then we have over nearly 4,500 records from yews. So they're female animals over 12 months of age, sorry, excuse me, over 24 months of age who have produced a lamb. Um, so in total, we've measured nearly 2,700 animals across four sheep flocks. Um, and starting just last week, um, our technician here, Owen Dunn, has started to go out to both pedigree and commercial farms measuring methane. Um, so he'll be visiting a range of farms across the country and Noreen will mention that in a little bit more detail later. So just to give you an idea of what the methane output is looking like, 
from animals at different production stages across our systems. So as we can see from the graph, we have methane outputs in grams per day from lambs, hoggets, dry ewes, and lactating ewes. And as you might expect, the lowest methane production is from a lamb, where the greatest methane production is from a lactating ewe. And that's regardless of live weight. And you might ask yourselves why this is the case. But when I show the next graph, and this is the dry matter intake of the animals, which we have also measured at grass. So their methane output directly follows their dry matter intake, which is directly related to their production. So as you can imagine, a lactating ewe um, at peak lactation, where she's rearing one or two lambs and producing milk, she's eating approximately two and a half kilos of dry matter every day. Um, she is producing more methane, but she's also under more production pressure and consuming more energy. So how do our meth methane output values from sheep compare to those from dairy cows or from beef cattle? Um, so I've just taken some data from other studies that have looked at dairy cow methane output and beef cattle methane output using respiration chambers and SF6 as the two measuring techniques. Um, so as you can see, the dairy cow has the highest methane production. Again, not surprising given the fact that she is under the most production pressure and producing um, you know, large quantities of milk for the amount of food that she's eating. Um, the beef animal is somewhat lower than the dairy cow, but still producing about 200 grams of methane a day, which obviously looks quite large compared to the sheep here on the far right hand side. So you can see from, from the respiration chamber and the SF6 technique, the sheep is producing on average about 32 grams of methane per day. And I know you're all saying to yourself at this point, oh, that's great. So the sheep is fine. We're so small compared to the others, but that's exactly it. The sheep is so small. So when you look at it on a per kilo live weight basis, you have to remember that a sheep is about 10 times smaller than a dairy cow in terms of live weight, but their methane output is the same per kilo live weight as a dairy cow or a beef animal. Um, and I think sometimes we can, you know, maybe be too quick to assume that the sheep are okay because they're small animals. And yes, that is true. But when you look at it per kilo live weight, they're relatively the same as the dairy and beef animal. So it just means for us as farmers, we all need to do our bit and the onus is on all of us, whether we're farming sheep, beef, or dairy, or tillage or pigs or anything else. Um, we need to take on measures that are gonna to help to mitigate methane across our systems, but also improve our profitability and our production efficiencies. So it's a win-win for everybody. We've also looked at some of the factors that are affecting methane output across our sheep systems. So the age of the animal directly impacts their methane output. And for a ewe, her parity or the number of times she's given birth to lambs has an impact on methane output. Similarly, the live weight of the animal, as I just spoke about, and also for lambs, their weaning weight will directly affect their methane output within that first year of life. The body condition score of the animal has been shown to affect methane output with ewes that are in poor body condition having higher output values than yours that are in ideal body condition. And again, that relates back to her, you know, being under pressure. And if you is under pressure to try to, you know, maintain her energy, um, she's eating more to try and do that. And then for she's producing more methane. When we look at rearing litter size, so we can see that it is impacting methane output. Um, the time off feed, so when we measure animals in the pack chambers, they're removed from feed for a period of 50 minutes. And if we extend the time that they're removed off feed, we can see that the methane output declines, but that's just due to their rate of digestion. And then the diet type that the animal is on. So we've measured animals on a perennial ryegrass-based diet. We've measured animals grazing perennial ryegrass plus companion forages. And we've measured animals from silage-based diets and from um, alternative forages and Noreen will talk through some of these results. So I'll hand it over to Noreen. So just um, to follow on from Fiona then um, and discuss some of the strategies that we can use um, to reduce greenhouse gas gases. 
Um, so again, this is accumulation of the work that Jonathan and Fiona have already mentioned. Um, and this is a lovely graphic that has been done by the Signpost Programme in conjunction with Fiona and Philip Creighton in Chagas, Gatton Rai, to show 10 steps that farmers can implement on their own farm to help to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm not going to talk through all of these. Um, as Fiona and Jonathan have mentioned a lot of these already, but just to highlight some of the lower hanging fruit or some of the uh, steps that could be implemented quite quickly on, on sheep farms uh, are management practices such as grassland, using protected urea, uh, using the low emission slurry spreading, maintaining your soil fertility and applying lime. So Jonathan has already mentioned these and these can give us quick gains in terms of reducing our greenhouse gases um, from sheep systems. What I'm going to focus on more today is on the breeding element, um, is what we can do from a breeding point of view, be it from finishing lambs earlier, increasing the proliferacy of our yews, or using Eurostar indexes to help and to reduce the methane emissions um, on our flocks. And finally, then I'm just going to mention briefly some of the dietary work that Fiona is currently has currently ongoing in Atenray, Chagas Atenray, um, and its, impl Im its potential impact on reducing our greenhouse gases from the overall sheep sector. So just to start off with breeding, one of the first things that we've looked at is what is the impact of proliferacy or increasing our actual uh, production from the yo in terms of um, in reducing greenhouse gases. So to start off with, uh, we've used data from Chagas Atenray uh, on a study that Philip Creighton undertook on the research demo flock where he looked at three different stocking rates which is what's illustrated here uh, where he looked at a low a medium and a high stocking rate they represented 10 yews per hectare 12 or at the high level of 14 yews per hectare so slightly higher the low slightly higher than the national average at about 7.7 .7, as, as Jonathan mentioned but they're representative I suppose of you know your lower base right up to the high base. Across each of these uh, stocking rates um, Philip ran a trial which had two different proliferacies, so two different um, weaning rate potentials of the yews. So there was at a 1.5 lambs wean per yew and then a 1.8 lamb, so a high and a medium uh, proliferacy. So that trial ran for four years and all the data was collected over the production year, so starting at mating, all housing data was collected, lots of information was collected at the lambing time as well. And then it followed all the lamb growth performance throughout the year and the yo performance in producing um, a finished lamb. So like I said, this, this table just highlights all the data that was collected on each of these six systems. Remember, we've three different uh, three different stocking rates across two, three, two different proliferacies or weaning rates. Um, and all that data showed that there was big differences um, in terms of your stocking rate and proliferacy. What we wanted to do rather than look at the performance was to link it to the actual economic um, output or economic potential from each of these systems. So like I, like I said, we, we took the real life data from the farm that uh, from the research demo farm in Atten Rai, ran it through what we call our bioeconomic model and that give us a value in terms of net profit of each system. And that's highlighted in the graph here um, in terms of the net profit across each of the six different systems. And as you see, uh, pretty much as you increase your stocking rate and your proliferacy, we saw a lift in profit going from a low of 361 euro uh, per hectare up to 600 or up to 802 euro when we had a high stocking rate and also a high weaning weight of our yews. So it showed that there was lots of uh, lifts in performance and a lift in terms of economics that could uh, be achieved through lifting stocking rate and uh, our weaning rate or our proliferacy of our yews. But the next question was, well, what does that do to greenhouse gases? So as Jonathan mentioned, he has his LCA model, his life cycle assessment model. And what we did is ran these figures through his model to see what is the actual greenhouse gas intensities from each of these systems. So again, remember it's on real life data, real farm data coming from the research demonstration flock in Atmarai. And here is a graph of the, of the greenhouse gas intensities from each of these six systems. What I want to highlight here is really that as you increased your proliferacy, so if you could wean 1.8 lambs per yo, what we saw is that there was a reduction in the greenhouse gas intensity in terms of our output when we expressed it in terms of our kilograms of carcass weight produced for each of the systems. So it shows that proliferacy 
in selecting a yo that can wean more lambs, it will reduce our greenhouse gas intensities. Um, so it's one of the strategies that we can use um, to, reduce, um, to reduce greenhouse gases from the sheep system. So that's well and good that we have this proliferacy, but how do we actually go about selecting these animals? So the next step that we wanted to look at is um, looking at our Eurostar indexes. So these are the indexes that are operated by Sheep Ireland, where our rams are ranked in terms of their replacement potential, including proliferacy, like I mentioned, and also um, uh, ranked in terms of their ter terminal potential. So what we had here was two different scenarios. We looked at the five star animals, so the best animals in terms of their genetic potential for replacement or terminal traits, and we compared them to the one star animals. What we wanted to see again was what would be the lift in performance, in profitability, and finally in greenhouse gases between these. So again, we used real data to actually model this. So we took data from the Sheep Ireland CPT or Central Progeny Test Flocks. They're a, fl a, a flock of about two and a half thousand yews across four different farms spread across Ireland. They're all commercially run farms. We collect all that data from them. And from that, we wanted to look within their population, what was our five-star animal um, achieving for us compared to our one-star animal? When we look at the performance differences, there was lots of performance differences, but I just want to highlight two of the main differences um, on why we should select, select five-star animals. The first one is proliferacy again, or our weaning weight, in that we saw that our five-star animals were weaning us about 1.7 lambs per yo, whereas our one-star animals were one, back at 1.54 1 uh, lambs per yo. So it's, we can see straight away a lift in our weaning rate or the number of lambs we actually have to finish from selecting five-star animals. The other big difference we saw, it was in terms of days to slaughter or the growth potential of the animals. So our five-star, our animals from five-star rams reached slaughter approximately 13 days earlier compared to the one-star animals. So again, big differences in terms of flock performance, but what does that mean in, econ in the economic terms or in profitability for farms? So again, we ran this through our bioeconomic model uh, using the, all this real farm data to look at the economic potential. And what we saw there is that there was a big lift in terms of our um, economic or our profit in terms of uh, expressing a per hectare basis or on a per yo basis, where we saw that our five star animals were achieving um, an 18 euro more profit per yo compared to the one star animals. So big lifts in performance could be achieved by selecting the right genetics for our flocks. Again, we wanted to follow this on and look at it from a greenhouse gas intensity. Could we select animals that were more profit, but also reduce our greenhouse gas in terms of our unit output? And again, this is coming from work that Jonathan has done, where I've highlighted the five star animals in the red bar here. The blue animals on, are on the, or the one star animals are on the blue line here. Again, what we're seeing is the greenhouse gas intensity per unit of output was lower for our five star animals, 7% lower compared to the one star animals. Again, we've more animals in the system, they're getting away to slaughter earlier, so it reduces our greenhouse gas intensity um, for the overall system. So good uh, positive results from this, both in terms of our proliferacy potential and also in terms of using our Eurostar indexes. They're selecting more productive animals with reduced greenhouse gas intensity. However, when it comes to the question of methane, and as Jonathan and Fiona have said, about 65% of the um, greenhouse gases coming from sheep is coming from the actual methane. So the next question then comes, can we actually select animals that have reduced methane as well as being more efficient? Fiona has mentioned the, the pack chambers that we have up and running now where we've collected a lot of data to date on different animals across different environments. And what we wanted to look at then, well, was there differences in the genetic potential of these animals to breed animals that actually produce lower methane while also um, giving us an efficient animal in terms of our weaning weight, days to slaughter and all the other important traits. So what we did is we looked at the data that Fiona has already spoken about from a genetic point of view. And the first question we asked, well, is it under genetic control or is it heritable? So when we, we talk about heritability, what we're basically saying is how much of the difference between animals is due to the genetic potential. From looking at the methane data that we have on Irish sheep, we see that the, the heritability of the trait is about 25%. 
What that means in practice, if you had two sheep in front of you, 25% of the difference in the methane output between those two sheep is purely down to the genetics of that animal. It's not down to the environment that animal is in or the management system or the breed or the parity. It's very much driven by the genetic potential. So it tells us we can make lots of genetic progress or lots of progress in methane if we understand the genetic potential of it. The other uh, result that we got is that it's a highly repeatable trait as well. It's approximately 40% repeatable. If we compare this to other well-known traits like milk yield or live weight, it's roughly about the same level of repeatability as milk yield, slightly lower than live weight. And what that means is that there's a strong relationship between methane measured in a young animal and at a later, later stage in life, which again is a great result um, in terms of a genetic potential. So the next steps leading on from that then was to actually look at the breeding values. Could we develop breeding values for methane for our sheep? And this is just preliminary results from the data we have to date. But on this graph here, I want to highlight the blue line to start with. That's across the entire population of sheep that we have methane measurements on to date. You can see we've set the, the relative or the, the average value to zero here. Um, so the, rel the average animal has a breeding value of zero. But what this also tells us is there's a large spread in the actual uh, genetic potential of animals to, for methane output. So we have some animals up here at the extremes that are producing on average about three and a half to four grams of methane, more methane per day than the average who is down at zero. And then we have the really efficient animals in terms of methane down at producing almost, almost five grams of methane less per day uh, compared to their contemporary, to their the average animals or their contemporaries. So again, showing us this huge variation within the breed within all the animals we've looked at. Then we've looked at individual breeds. So I've highlighted here in, in the brown color, the Belclair breed, then the, the Charlies, the Texels, and the Suffolks here in green. Really what I want to show here is that there's huge variation within each of the breeds. No one breed is going to fix the problem of methane output or try and reduce improve methane output from our sheep industry because what we're seeing here is there's as much variation within each of the breeds as there is across breeds. So the next step, morning, we've about a minute to go. Perfect. I'm just finishing up anyway, Mark. So the next steps, sorry, now is to actually um, start producing Eurostar or star ratings for these animals. So we want to start giving star ratings, the one star animals to these animals that are producing a lot more methane relative to their contemporaries and then five stars um, to the animals that are producing a lot less. Briefly to mention diets, as Fiona alluded, alluded to earlier, what we're seeing is that diets can have, the diet that the sheep is fed can have a massive impact on the methane output. Based on work for, that Fiona has done in Atten Rye, we see that there's a reduction in 12% um, in terms of methane output in grams per day when we introduce either clover, be that white or red clover or plantain into our perennial ryegrass um, as opposed to ju just a straight perennial ryegrass um, sward. So lots of potential coming from diet and these are preliminary results um, that we will look at and more in the future. So just to wrap up then, our key messages is the sheep systems here in Ireland, it's a, it produces a highly valuable nutritional commodity produced mainly from a grass-based di diet and often in areas of the country where we can't produce any more protein source. The average carbon footprint has now been um, shown to be by Jonathan's model at about 10.8 grams of CO2 equivalents per, per kilo of live weight. From Fiona's work, we know now that we have uh, lots of methane measurements coming in quick and fast on, um, on sheep, our packs, uh, so our portable accumulation chambers have been validated. We now have baseline data for sheep here in Ireland. And we saw from Fiona's work that there's a multitude of factors that affect methane, including feed intake and diet type. And I suppose the take home message from it is that we know that uh, in terms of the methane emissions coming from sheep, it's a small proportion of the overall in terms of the agriculture, uh, the total agricultural sector here in Ireland. But it doesn't mean that we can sit on our laurels. We have to be pro proactive within the sheep industry to try and adopt meat mitigation strategies, be they management tools, using breeding or do using different diets. So that's a quick um, summary of it and just again to highlight the sheep open day that's coming up in Chagas on the 18th of June. Thank Back you, Noreen. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for keeping on time. Uh,
we allowed a little extra time given the, the fact that we had uh, three separate presenters this morning and so lots of interest coming through through, through the q a but a reminder if you do have a question for any of our, our speakers here this morning do send them through to us um if i could maybe ask fiona you know farmers looking at to the, this morning's presentation and they're looking at there's lots of messages coming at farmers uh, at different directions uh, from a climate pers perspective, mainly at the moment. But what are the key key recommendations you would have for farmers or what would be the, the first uh, step on the ladder to, to reducing your uh, carbon footprint and give accepting that there are there's no silver bullet and that there are many different uh, uh, strategies. But, you know, what would be the kind of where would you see the low hanging fruit here? Yeah, so as you said, Mark, there is no silver bullet and in most things in life there isn't. Um, Noreen addressed so management, breeding and dietary factors that can help in our mitigation strategies. And I suppose those management factors, as we're terming them, are probably seen as the low hanging fruit. So getting your soil fertility up to scratch, applying lime where you need to apply lime, using protected urea where possible, but also applying your compound fertilizers where they're required. Um, you know, not putting out excess chemical in where you don't need it. You have to think about these things are also going to help your profitability, but also um, reduce your greenhouse gas emissions from your farm gate. Thanks. Thanks, Fiona. Um, there was a question there I had for uh, Jonathan, if you're joining us there. Yeah, perfect. Jonathan, you presented a figure, some figures there around the decrease in emissions since 1990. Um, uh, going from 1.6 to, to 1 uh, megaton uh, per, uh, per year. Uh, is that that reduction, is that related to the, the number of animals as opposed to the, uh, the actual intensity per animal? You're on mute there, Jonathan. Apologies. Yeah, no, it's entirely associated with uh, the population. So the, IPC, the inventory method uses a tier one method. So it doesn't fully take into account the productivity uh, or the change in productivity of a yo or its lambs. So it's uh, purely down to the population. Mm -hmm. And it's largely down to the, the drop. There has been a drop in the lowland uh, population, but it's primarily down to um, the drop in uh, the hill population since the 90s. Okay, very good, very good. And just on that, actually, we did have a question coming in uh, around the difference between uh, hill sheep production systems and lowland yep. sheep productions is there is there a significant difference there between those types of systems or do do we know that uh, in terms of their carbon intensity um is i'm not sure if that's a question for you jonathan oh yeah no that's that's perfect no and uh, it's a good question uh like, sorry now due to time constraints i didn't delve too much into it i just uh, focused on the lowland but yeah we did we have done work on a comparison of uh, lowland versus hills and when we look at emissions per kilo output on a gross basis, so um, what we see is that the lowland is around 10.8 kilos of CO2 per kilo live weight. When we look at it on, for a hill system, it's 14. But when the important thing that, uh, to add on to this is the potential for carbon sequestration, the lowland system or the hill systems um, are vastly less stocked. Uh, so there's more carbon, uh, sequester carbon associated with a hill lamb uh, per kilo live width than with a low lamb. So when you account for carbon sequestration, the emissions per kilo live width is actually less for a hill system than a lowland. Uh, so it's a pro it's, when you account for carbon sequestration, it's approximately nine kilos uh, for a lowland and uh, seven kilos of CO2 equivalent for a hill. And just, uh, just a point to add on to that is that the carbon is only one, the carbon, uh, car the carbon footprint is only one metric. Mm. Um, you have to identify, you have to highlight the importance of the hill system sector too, in that it's, um, you know, it's utilizing land that cannot be utilized for any other agricultural purposes as, as such, or has a low uh, use of other agricultural purposes. So in terms of uh, providing high quality, nutritious meat, it's, um, it's definitely uh, serves this purpose and has a good fun uh, there's a function. No, it's a really important point. I mean, we, we can go chasing after carbon at the detriment of other yep. uh, metrics such as biodiversity, water quality, and uh, like you say there, so there's, there's this, a social aspect to this as well. So it's really important to, to, to take that holistic approach. Andy, some really good questions coming through from our viewers this morning. Yeah, loads of questions. I'm not going to get through 
as many of us would like, maybe. Um, there's one uh, very spe uh, specific uh, one there. Does the age of the sheep ha have any impact on the amount of methane that is produced by the animal? Yeah, so I can take that, Andy. So it's a bit yes and no. As the animal ages or their level of production intensity increases, their methane output will increase. Yeah. Um, but within an individual group of animals, so if you take a group of lambs, for example, um, that are all in or around, you know, under the 12 months of age, you're seeing a negative relationship. So the younger animal will have um, lower output to the older animal. Yeah. And <clears throat> on a couple of the presentations there, you spoke about the inventories and the work that we're doing to try and change to go from, if you like, back to a more national uh, inventory figure. Is there any idea when that, or are there any timelines of when we may be able to use those for, uh, for our IPCC commitments? So I can take it. Um, at the moment, we don't have a timeline, and I suppose it's the same across dairy, beef, and sheep. Um, but we are working with the government on it, um, and a lot of our Chagas research is feeding directly into this. Um, so we're hoping that, yeah, it'll be sooner rather than later. And maybe for Noreen, there's a kind of a specific one. You showed the difference there between the one star and the five star um, per kilo of, of carcass weight. I presume it would be something similar per, if you were looking at it per hectare, or how, how, would it, how would those figures stack up if you looked at it on a per hectare basis, Noreen? So in per hectare basis, yeah, as well, what, what we're seeing is um, the greenhouse gas intensities um, is less for the five star animals because you, you have that dilution effect um, in terms of you have more animals per hectare um, to, to, well, sorry, that's if you express it uh, per unit of output. On a per hectare basis, it, be it the proliferacy study or the five star animals, we will see an increase in the greenhouse gases because you're carrying more animals um, on a per hectare basis. Um, but I suppose the key thing to bring on from that, Andy, is is the work that we're doing now at the genetic potential that so that in the future we can have potentially more animals or more efficient animals per hectare, but they are producing less uh, methane um, at an individual animal level. Yeah, um, and the final question here, Mark, maybe before I hand back to you, um, does lambing yews at 12 months versus 24 months for the first time have any effect on the overall farm emissions? So, work? again, it's it's work we have ongoing, and Fiona can comment on it as well, and um, to, to look at that um, when we have all that data together, based on what you'd assume if you express your greenhouse gas gases uh, per unit of output, you'd imagine you lamb your yo earlier and she's lasting longer in the system, she's going to reduce your greenhouse gas intensity as long as she is lasting as long in the system um, as lambing at two years of age. So the more efficient animals is what we're seeing is we're reducing our greenhouse gases per unit of output. And sorry, Mark, I just want to get in one more. Uh, there's, there's, there's a few questions there around clover. And, you know, sometimes we talk about putting clover into new swards, but is there any work being done, um, you know, on keeping clover in swards? Uh, I presume, you know, the type of clover, whether it's a small leaf or a large, you know, um, it can be, is it, are you finding difficulty, the, the few questions here around the difficulty of possibly keeping clover in swords um, whilst on, on the sheep system? Yeah, so I suppose two separate questions there, and uh, in relation to um, clover, so from our research work in Athenry, we are measuring animals that are on um, perennial ryegrass and clover-based swords, and we are seeing a reduction in methane output through our farm-based work. So where we're going out on farms, we will have you know, animals are more permanent pasture. Um, and we're also looking at the relationship between methane output and the, the pasture or the diet type that the animal is consuming. So that work is ongoing at the moment. Um, and then in relation to keeping clover in the sword, so for sheep, you're looking for a small leaf clover. Um, they're quite nifty animals that um, selecting what they like, a bit like us humans, and they will, they will preferentially graze the clover out of the sword. Um, so yeah, Philip Creighton and um, some of his colleagues here in Athenry are doing a lot of work on that and there will be a lot of emphasis on it at the Sheep Open Day. So um, if you have a particular interest in it, I would recommend that you come along to that. 
That's a, it's, it's a really important uh, point because clover is uh, a major part of the overall uh, mitigation strategies for reducing our dependence on on uh, artificial nitrogen. And uh, yeah, it, 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 that's, that is something I think that would be uh, sustaining, I think, is the challenge, isn't it? Sustaining the clover within the, the sward um like like you say there like, uh, noreen uh, just a question i have for you in relation to the slide you showed stocking rates and uh weaning rates uh and, and i was just wondering how significant is that difference between the high stocking rate and the the low stocking rate with the higher weaning rates uh, i think it was somewhere between 22.6 and 21 i think was the but just how significant is that? It, it, you know, farmers are, you know, working hard to, to to have a higher stocking rate, but maybe would they be better off having the medium stocking rate? Uh, just a just a just a question. Um. So in terms of the methane output, there's very little difference between your stocking rates. Where we're seeing the biggest um biggest differences is is, is on the proliferacy going from your one point five weaning one point five to one point eight. That's mm -hmm. in a greenhouse. Uh, it, it, it depends, I suppose, how we express our greenhouse gas. If we express it per kilos uh, per kilogram of output, obviously your prol proliferacy or lifting your um, stock proliferacy is having the bigger effect. In terms of stocking rate, what we're seeing, it's it's the same trend that we'll actually um, we will um, increase our greenhouse gas emissions by increasing stocking rate um, because we have more animals within that individual hectare. Um, but I suppose it's a trade-off between efficiency in terms of our pro and profitability um, and greenhouse gases. So there, there is a trade-off trade there um, yeah. to be had. You're lifting your profitability, but you are, are in, you are increasing your greenhouse gas intensity slightly at a per hectare basis. Yes, and, and the way the emissions are measured at the moment, it is on that overall emissions, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, um, I'm afraid we're out of time. We're a little over time, but uh, thank you so much uh, for those presentations, Jonathan, Fiona and Noreen. Uh, we really do appreciate the time and effort that you have put in. And I, I felt, you know, they were very clear and understandable presentations as well. Sometimes uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not always easy to, 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 to understand somebody's uh, graphs and, and uh, uh, charts and so on, but you've obviously you've honed those uh, presentations very well over the, the, the years. Um, also, thanks, Andy, for helping with the questions. And uh, I want to say thank you to Yvonne Maher uh, for helping out in the background this morning. Uh, a reminder, once again, that that Sheep Open Day is on the 18th of June in Chagas, Ganath and Rye. And uh, full details are available on the Chagas website. Um, so do, do go along and I'm sure uh, you get a chance to meet with uh, Fiona and Noreen and, and Jonathan if you have any further questions on, on what was raised today. So thanks again uh, and uh, wish you all an enjoyable long weekend. Uh, next week, we're going to be joined by a representative from Keelings who are going to be talking about their sustainability uh, journey. So uh, do join us next Friday at 9.30 for uh, the Signpost webinar. So we'll sign out at that and thanks again, everyone. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost series the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.